Bueno, ba, eskerrik asko, islari guztiei, oso oso ekarpen interesgarriak, eta ez da baita arako tartea zabalduko dugu. Aurretarako, itza emango diot e, 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 errastiri, eta e, aipatu nahi genukena da, e, atzerapen txikitxu bat daramagula, bos minutukoa, baina, ala ere, e, ez da baita garrantzia eman nahi diogunez, lasai, eh? ordu bete izango dugu nahi inguruan aritzeko. Eta beste digabe, ba, itxa zurea da. Mi esker zelai, uh, bueno, lehenik eta hain, mi esker bai ikusten arizareten guzti hoi, eta nola ez antolakuntzari zelaiek ondo esan duen gisa denbora zertxo bait larri gabiltza, beraz zuzenean ez da bai dara pasako naiz. Uh, thank you very much to all the four panelists that we have had uh, right now in this uh, very exciting panel. And I will, uh, first of all, give you the chance of uh, interacting between each other. So providing uh, a question, if you would like, uh, to each other, if there is particularly anything that you would like to clarify or uh, to ask your colleagues to go a bit uh, farther. So that will be my first uh, option that I offer you as panelists of this first panel. And actually, I, I will ask Francesco, uh, Elisenda, Nicolas, and Constanza to turn on their cameras and microphones, please. Thanks. Oh, well, I can break the ice in case. Um, Go ahead. There is something um, uh, Constanza and I have discussed over WhatsApp uh, uh, during the break. And it is an issue uh, of, of clarification. Um, I think the important problem here is also to um, consider uh, the uh, role of minorities, right? Um, and minorities have to be protected in different ways. Uh, and one of the way to consider, to take minorities into consideration is to avoid over simplification in terms of uh, who is the body who decides, right? The European Union is one of these uh, um, anti-majoritarian or, or pluralistic institutions. But I think we should also be very careful uh, in, in using the language, and sometimes this has happened also uh, here, uh, when saying, let's say, Scots want independence, Catalans want independence, whoever wants something. I mean, this is, this is, this is dangerous. This is not the case. I mean, the problem, and this is one of the points I was making, um, cautioning uh, with the, the exclusive use of referendum, is precisely that perhaps it's half of the society wanting something and the other half wanting the opposite. Or uh, as we have witnessed it in uh, the case of Brexit with um, minority nations such as uh, Scotland and, and Northern Ireland uh, voting um, in favor of remaining but being outvoted by the English majority. I mean, this is exactly the point. Um, I think we should be very careful in respecting all the different minorities and uh, the referendum is not the most suited instrument to take minorities into account. And this is why I was making the point of um, adding other um, procedural guarantees to the use of referendums. I guess Costanza would like to make a comment on that or it is fine? Yeah, no, no. Um, yeah. I think that there are two kinds of minorities. This is very important. First of all, as I said in my conclusion, which were very, very, very short, uh, I I'm still have problems between the um, relation between secession and democracy. I conclude saying that I'm not sure which are the right um, pro the democratic procedures better, which are the procedure that can be defined uh, completely democratic. This will remain always a problem, which is not my problem. Fortunately, since I'm a legal philosopher, I would say that is a problem of the political scientists. Okay, so I always said, I've written a lot by this, there is a huge problem of relation between secession and democracy. And I always said that secession 
uh, can be defined only as the ultimate right because the mm, acceptance of democratic secession would mean that everyone could secede until the last person in the earth. And this is why this would put the end of the system of states. So this is philosophical. Now, going back to my uh, minority problem. So um, uh, um, um, uh, um, keeping aside my philosophical um, uh, um, uh, position, minorities. There are two types of minorities that have to be guaranteed. And this is a problem. If you have territorial minorities, which is the case of the Scottish in this moment who have voted against Brexit, am I clear? Here, you should absolutely um, envisage the possibility of secession in secession. But these are territorial concentrated minorities, which could happen also in Catalonia. You have an enclave of Spanish people who wants to secede from Catalonia. You need to give them the same right you have exercised. But this is a problem of secession of minority group territorially concentrated. And these I've always said, whenever you exercise the right to secession as a territorial concentrated group, you have to recognize the same right to all the minorities existing that are the, the same right to vote, the right to decide, uh, in order to decide if they want to secede from the new state. And this is the problem of guaranteeing territorial concentrated minority group. The other problem, but well, this is the problem of democracy, is political minorities. How can you always guarantee political minorities? This is a huge problem of democracies, of which kind of democracy? Of majoritarian democracy. But again, this is a political problem, of course. And here I think that Francesco is completely right. You cannot reduce democracy to a majoritarian principle for two reasons. And I, and I said it very quickly, while Francesco said it very rightly and longly, because he knows much better than me all these things, the majoritarian principle, majority is not neutral, it's constructed. You construct majority before you go to a referendum, when you decide who's going to vote, when you decide that people uh, that have 16 years can already vote, you have already decided the majority, okay? Because majority is not neutral. So this is the problem that I completely agree with Francesco, that referendum, and I said it very quickly at the end, cannot be a one shot instrument. You have to in include the referendum inside something more procedural. Then either you accept completely the five points of Francesco that in my opinion are in some ways too many. I mean, we could choose three between five, okay? But they are absolutely useful in order to let people vote, guarantee political minorities. So, Again, uh, to conclude, political minorities, you, you have to find two ways of guaranteeing political, mm, sorry, uh, minorities concentrated mm, group and political minorities. Again, whenever you do a referendum, also the only referendum that I won in my life was for public water in Italy, there again, you had a political minority and that, that 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 time I was very happy that there was a political minorities because I I, I won the referendum for public for public water. So this is always a problem of referendum. So the way in which they decide the quorum, and this is the big difference between a referendum for public water, and this I said very quickly, the referendum that will choose new borders. It must be very different. And here I end clear majority, we have to decide what it means because the court didn't, the Canadian court never told us what it meant by clear majority. The only point in which I do not agree with Francesco, because in this case, I agree with the Canadian court, I am for a clear question. Yes, no. You want to say it? Yes, no. I will never ask a three point question. You want to say it? Yes, no. 
or do you want much more autonomy? There must be a clear question because you have to have a clear answer by the people who are going to vote. I end the clear question uh, should be um, clear also. And here again, it cannot be in some way um, um, influenced by the EU non-position. For sure, as it was said in the third video, the fact that European Union was against an immediate entry of Scotland in the EU has for sure influenced the result of that referendum. What would be very interesting now is against Brexit, European institution to um, uh, help Scotland to make a new referendum in order to have a new member state against UK inside the EU. This is why secession is interesting because it opened so many different, not only legal, but also political framework. Amazing, Constanza. And actually, you were already answering most of those issues that are opening. Uh, just kidding. So I guess that Nikos and Elisenda, uh, Elisenda and Nikos, if we follow the order of the presentations, uh, maybe we have some comments on that, I'm sure. Um, thanks very much um, for, for giving me the floor. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to say that I found um, all three other presentations um, fascinating. Fascinating. Sorry. I just wanted to make a, a brief comment that links a bit to the, the debate that, that we've just been having, because if not, I mean, I would have a lot of comments and questions and we want to open the floor. And I mean, it relates to um, Francesco's sort of argument that the referendum can't be, you know, the main thing, it can't be the only thing. And then also to this discussion about, you know, the counter-majoritarian role of, of the referendum and a yes, no question. And I think an important point to, to make here, it links also to um, Michael Keating's presentation yesterday, is that, you know, in the current context where these sort of traditional notions of state and sovereignty, it's all, it's all a bit different. I think after the referendum, then it becomes the issue of discussing, of negotiating what secession really means if there is, if there is a secession, because secession could have many different forms, could mean many different things. I remember in the case of Scotland, when we had you know, all the debates about um, Scottish independence, the actual model put forward by the SNP of independence was one that retained a lot of links with actually the USA state. It was known very much as kind of a model of, of independent light. So, and we're seeing it again also, or we've seen it in the context of, of Brexit. After the Brexit vote, we then led, it, it started kind of long period of negotiations, maybe now so much not negotiations, as to what the new relationship of the UK with the European Union would be. And for a while, it looked like there was an option for secession that still looked very much like some form of remaining within the European Union. So I think it's also important we talk about secession, not secession, but there are many different forms of secession which need to be negotiated. So any black and white referendum, I think, then has to be included in this sort of longer and more extensive negotiated process, which I think therefore also and fundamentally has to include um, the different minorities involved. That was all I wanted to say, thank you. Thanks, Elisenda. Um, I'm sure, Nikos, that you will want to make a last comment on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have a, I don't have much to add uh, in this part of the debate. I mean, other than say to say that um, I I agree to a certain extent with Francesco that um, um, uh, referendums are very very important, but uh, uh, should be part of a, of a broader uh, procedure. And I think in that sense. Um, the, 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 the code of conduct, the, the code of good practice that we are discussing is important because uh, referendums do appear there, but they appear within a, a broader uh, democratic framework. And, and, to, uh, and in that sense, I want to add one, uh, one last thing. I mean, um, the, 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 there is no doubt that um, the um, territorial sovereignty conflict that we all have in mind when we discuss now um, are for regions that they, they are aspiring to become um, um, democratic states, right? Where, uh, you know, they, they would be following um, uh, the Copenhagen criteria and so on and so forth. However, uh, this doesn't mean that we should take that for granted. Uh, and I think that EU, the EU has a role to play there. I, I think that the, the same pre-accession scrutiny that applies to other uh, candidate states 
speed of light also to, uh, uh, to, to, to the regions that won't become states and we, we all have in mind. We shouldn't take for granted that um, uh, because now we do law applies to them, um, there, there shouldn't be any kind of uh, check uh, once they want uh, to, to, to become a full member state of uh, the EU. Amazing. Uh, thanks, Nikos. And actually, this connects with uh, a question that I, I had in mind. And before going to the uh, discussions and, and questions that we are already receiving, uh, a lot of them, that uh, we have time. Uh, I will use the uh, joker card of the moderator and launch a question, which is, I have the feeling that uh, following your presentations, we are all the time combining uh, two dimensions that actually I don't know whether they are so separated as it seems, which is the more principle-based approach to the issue and the more political or pragmatic approach to the issue. And there is there are some papers on that. Uh, Marcin Jauma has brought in a very interesting one recently. And I was wondering whether, in your view, this uh, sort of uh, good practices uh, approach to the topic, which apparently connects very much with the principle uh, idea, it's already enough to provide this uh, common framework to solve the problem or whether that it's so subjected to more political issues that the principle-based approach in itself is uh, definitely not able to, to deal with it. W which are your thoughts on that? Thanks. Uh, I, I think that we can follow the, the order that we have had on the intervention. So um, Costanza, I will give you the first word. My opinion. Um... I think it's a good starting point. First of all, because it's the first time that a group uh, decides to propose something that is uh, legally and uh, politically acceptable, in my opinion. I think that, as Nico said, it's also important that it appears for everyone as soft law. It's impossible that the states will ever ask EU to take into consideration the possibility of writing down hard law uh, on secessionist processes. I think that it's in, it's in some way uh, European law in this sense and international law are similar. Both are made by states. Mm, I'm, I'm, I'm banalizing, but this is the point. So no states will ask its own supranational organ to write down a rule that disrupt itself, the state. So this would be impossible. While since the European Union in this precise moment could be an actor that um, uh, in some way um, could render sovereignty conflicts peaceful because you never know. I mean, the point is this, until now inside Europe, you did have only peaceful sovereignty conflicts. But I mean, you never know, hmm? you never know. So it's better to have something <laughs> before some of the sovereignty conflicts uh, becomes conflicting. So this is the first point for which I do think that it would be important to render EU a possible actor. The second things to do, and this is hard law, in my opinion, is to have the possibility of um, a clause on internal enlargement. I think that it's a, this is an error, a mistake, not to have something that is called internal enlargement when, when, like in the case of Scotland, you would have had a consensual secession with the immediate recognition, which is not my liminal legality. My liminal legality is much more radical. So let's keep Scotland, which is not radical at all. You would have had the day after of a positive referendum, the recognition by UK after a, a, a quick negotiation of Scotland. Well, I think that it's a huge mistake not to have a, an article in the treaty for internal enlargement when you have a peaceful, recognized and bilateral secession. 
I, this is for me um, a, a mistake. Why? And so in that case, I would ask for hard law. Why? I think good practice, which is a soft law instrument, is absolutely useful and necessary because not all the secessionist processes goes like the one that we have um, witnessed in Scotland. Thanks, Constanza. Uh, actually, Francesco, but you can actually inter interrupt each other if you have any specifics or follow-ups, but Francesco, please go ahead. All right, so on your question, which is very important and also very difficult to answer. Um, I would say um, there is, of course, the, the borders between the principled and the pragmatic approach are blurred, uh, because actually both are important and both come to the to, to the fore uh, in this case. It will always be a political process. I mean, no question about it, right? And the very, uh, as Costanza said, uh, a institutional structure of the EU, which is still uh, international law after all, um, yeah, I mean, it makes it inevitable. But uh, I also believe this is a good uh, starting point, something like a code. Why? Because there is a very important uh, role of the European Union, uh, which sometimes uh, goes unnoticed because the European Union does not always perform this function very effectively, but is extremely important, which is to promote the rule of law. And this is exactly what we're talking about here, right? To suggest procedures you know you can agree with them uh, you can agree with some of them you can disagree with most of them this is again the political question but the fact that uh, this exercise suggests some procedural ways on how to procedurally meaning peacefully uh, address these uh, conflicts is an excellent starting point then it would be subject to to, um, to political negotiations. And this is a key aspect of the role of the European Union. Uh, as, as Nikos has also uh, reminded, I mean, uh, this is something on which the European Union is grounded according to the founding treaties. I mean, this is um, not so uh, irrelevant, I would say. I mean, it would be politically uh, a little bit utopian to expect the European Union to take the lead on that. It will never happen, period. Um, but uh, as a provider of the rule of law, as one of the suppliers of the rule of law, together with, with its member states, because member states and EU are not separable in this way, I think the role of the European Union is all but irrelevant. And if, it, uh, uh, if there are ways to help the EU uh, to perform this role, I think these are more than welcome. Thanks, Francesco, for this very encouraging uh, answer. Um, Elisenda, please, the floor is yours. Oh, the microphone, sorry, Elisenda. I, I muted myself. Thanks very much. Yeah, no, I mean, I also agree with, with the other speakers that I think um, setting out these principles in the protocol, I think is, is a very good um, step forward. Um, firstly, because, I mean, I think the EU acting through setting out or adhering to general principles. I mean, even if they are soft law, I, mean, I think soft law is a start, it's still some form of law. I think it's good because it's still, these are going to apply to a lot of very different member states that have very different ways of organizing their political community, of organizing um, decision-making. Again, you know, the contrast between Spain and the UK, I think is, is the clearest. So I think the fact of starting off just setting out these principles and these procedures, I really like kind of Francesco's and starting off and like talking about the proceduralization of, of conflict. So I think in this sense, um, principles are, are a great way to start. The other reason um, why I think they are so important and they're so significant is that currently we don't actually have a document with these set of principles that would address the type of conflicts that we are looking at. I mean, I think the majority of people would agree that the general international framework for self-determination is really of no use. The way it's been organized, the way it's been applied, it's been interpreted. So 
just agreeing, I mean, I think probably the majority of people who are in this conference would be in agreement on what these principles are, but I think there's no real articulation of them anywhere in a document. In our discussions, we all keep coming back to the Quebec secession reference, which is a great point of reference, but then we always have to kind of reinterpret it, reapply them to come back to the situations that, that we're looking at. So I think that just agreeing and setting out these basic principles in a document that then is there for the EU to adhere to, and to um, endorse and other organizations, I think is a great step in ensuring, as I said, the escalation of, of conflicts and the use of force. Thanks, Elisenda. So, Nikos, uh, last comment, and then we'll go for the uh, chat. Sure. Um, two very brief points. Um, the first one, <clears throat> with regard to uh, the difficulty of actually uh, codifying and uh, asking uh, for something to become a hard law, um, um, I mean, we have to remind ourselves that we are talking about an organization that has not managed to, to reach uh, an agreement on um, the recognition of Kosovo, right? So, you know, to, to, to ask them to actually uh, accept the possibility of, um, of, uh, of uh, codifying internal enlargement process is a very, very tall order. It, it, it is very, very difficult to, uh, con to, to, to achieve a unanimity for, on this issue. Um, which brings me to my second, to the second point, which was also my, my concluding point on uh, on my presentation. This idea of, uh, of of soft law and creating a framework of uh, of good practice. I think this is this is particularly uh, useful. Uh, not least because it's, uh, it's it's a very interesting exercise in, trans, in transnational constitutional law. I mean, just to plug one of your speakers later on, uh, uh, Timothy Waters, in his very very interesting book. Which provide which uh, provides for a for a for a democratic for a theory of democratic succession in in the last uh, in the last chapter that's precisely what he's trying to argue for for a kind of practices um, and um, this kind of transnational constitutional soft law that could be used as good practices whenever we have this kind of secessionist process. So in that sense, I think the the code that we are discussing is very very useful, very interesting, very important. Not least as an effort of actually trying to find some kind of common agreement, uh, uh, common denominator with regard to what is a very, very difficult process. Thanks, Nikos. Uh, now, because I'm kind of feeling like in minority report when they are in all those weird machines because I need to read the chat, the Q&A, and follow your very interesting answers. So I try my best. Uh, I will follow first with a question at the uh, actually at the Q&A section. And I will ask the attendees that if they may please send their questions through this um, uh, tool, it, it's easier for me. But in any ways, I will adapt. No worries. So uh, this is Stelay Nicolás's uh, question, and I read it as follows. It's in Basque, but I guess that the four of you have uh, the translators. So a referendum act. Uh, you don't have the translator, Nikos? Uh, OK, then I will proceed with the translation. Um, no, I, I will then ask another question that is already in English, and then I will <laughs> translate this one. So um, we have Nicola saying for Francesco, Nicola Makiwan, Professor Nicola Makiwan, if you have repeat uh, referendums to check the reliability of the decision, at what point would you expect secession negotiations to begin? After a first pro-secession vote or later? If the former, it, is it realistic to expect competing parties to dispute to negotiate in good faith when everything is still to play for in the next vote? And is the validity a second referendum not simply that is more current than the first? It is still a snapshot of a view unless it is to confirm the outcome of negotiations. But in that case, my first question arises again. So it's a complex question, Francesco, if you can answer it. Uh, and of course, the others are uh, free to add anything that you may want. Yes, and I will even try to combine two questions because I've seen in the, uh, so for the sake of, uh, of, of uh, uh, effectiveness. Uh, thank you, Nicola, first. This is a, an excellent point, of course. Um, well, uh, there are different alternatives that uh, are then to be decided politically in the end. One model we have uh, is the um, New Caledonian one. Uh, in New Caledonia, only one uh, vote pro-independence is enough. To, 
to start a process, to set it off. Um, another alternative I uh, would have in mind, which in my view might be perhaps more representative uh, and less of a snapshot, is uh, an average of the voting. You should take three votes within, let's say, three years, what have you, uh, and, and then you wait uh, participation, uh, turnout, and uh, outcome, and you see whether there is a majority or not. This would avoid, uh, for example, the snapshot effect. But of course, this is to be decided politically in advance. But what is important is to have a procedural framework. Uh, the second question I would uh, combine with that is, uh, as I see in the chat, um, it is very important to remember that Europe is not only the European Union. Uh, and there are actually other organizations, I think, in first place, the Council of Europe, but also the OSCE uh, that have very important uh, soft law documents uh, uh, which can actually provide important hints with with that uh, in that regard um, the the Lund recommendations have been uh, mentioned in the chat um, I think the whole uh, set of um, uh, soft law produced for example by the advisory committee on the framework convention for the protection of national minorities tells us a lot about you know the definition of minorities etc and the points raised by by uh, Costanza so um, I think uh, Europe at large should be included and there are already some important documents that can add to the soft law already in place uh, to which the code uh, uh, wants also to contribute. If any of the other panelists, but otherwise we have plenty of questions, so no worries. Yeah, okay, so uh, actually I will give the word to Professor Nicola Levrat. Uh, because he was asking it, and I think that he can connect the camera if uh, the background technicians confirm it. And if that's the case, uh, I will ask him to just turn on his microphone also once uh, he is uh, here. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, perfectly. Thanks, Nicole. Okay. Um, yes, as you may know, I'm based in Switzerland and we have a long practice of referenda. Uh, so we do believe that it can work even on complex issues. Now, I would like to react on the proposal of uh, Francesco. Hi, by the way. Um, I think it would be interesting to combine your idea of a threshold, quorum, as you call it, and repeated referenda. Somehow, in a referendum on, let's say, sovereignty, sovereignty question, there is no reason that the threshold is higher for one side and lower for the other side. Somehow, if you say those who want independence need to reach 60%, it means the threshold for those who are against is only 40% plus one. And this is not democracy. In democracy, the threshold should be the same for all sides. But you could say, OK, the threshold is 55 or 60 or 65, whatever, for both sides. And if no sides reach the threshold, then you repeat referenda every two years, three years until one side reaches the threshold. So that's one first element of reflection, and I would like to have your uh, opinion on that. Uh, second point, uh, it's based on experience that we had in Switzerland with creating the Canton of Jura, where we had a series of referenda at different stages of the process and at different level. So you may also envisage that referenda are being held at different stage of the process. Uh, in that case, I'll make it very short, but there was a first referendum in the canton of Bern from which Jura wanted to separate, and they accepted the principle that they could vote on separation. Then there was a vote, local government by local government, to see if there was a majority for leaving or not leaving. Second referendum. Third referendum, those who had voted in favor, they voted to constitute a new entity, and they are naturally accepted to constitute a new entity. Fourth referendum, those who had been left voted to accept that this new entity separates, and they did accept. And fifth referendum at the level of the whole Switzerland were accepted that the new entity, a new canton comes in. It's like the whole EU compared to a new member state. So I think referenda are still one of the best way we have to know what people want, what people think. I agree, it cannot just be one snapshot, but it is really an instrument that 
can be set in more complex process and just one vote yes or no and that's it. So that's just some reflection I wanted to add on that issue. Thank you. Um, the panelists, I guess that maybe the four of you have some comments on that, uh, or you maybe just agree. That's the case. Okay, then we will I proceed. completely agree. I couldn't agree more. I mean, the important uh, idea is to differentiate the process and not just to uh, fall into the snapshot. A snapshot trap, and I think the examples given by Nicola are, are perfect. Great. Uh, so now I will proceed with the Q and A question that, and the technicians have commented me from the background that if you click on the interpretation uh, button at the bottom of the Zoom, you can choose their English, and then you will receive the translation. Is it fine? Nicolas puts face of not having it really clear. Otherwise, I can. Yeah, you have it? No. Awesome. No, Costanza? How do you do it? Uh, you see the interpretation uh, the around the globe uh, down in the Zoom. Otherwise, I, I can yeah, yeah. Seen, seen yeah. No Grazie mille. So now, if you choose English, you will uh, listen to me in English. So uh, I proceed. Mr. Nicolas asks A referendum, Buru Javetza Processuetan, Tresna Egokia Bada. Erritarren borondatea ezagutzeko, batera garria da demokrazia eta zuzenbide estatuarekin estatuko konstituzioak mugak jartzea ez estatu arte. Erreferendumak deitzeko lurraldearen erakunde politikoi autonomia politikoa aitortu ta dutenak? Ja, yeah. so that's the... The question, I was giving some uh, space for the translator, um, who will, who can proceed with the answer? Oh, Elisenda, the microphone, thanks. Would it be possible, sorry, to, to repeat it the final part of the question? It's just when you intervened, I think that's why everybody went quiet. When you intervened, the translator was still translating, so. Okay, then I will repeat the question. And when, when the translator has finished, please make like this. Thanks. So, erreferendumak burujabetza prozesuetan tresna egokia bada erritarren borondatea ezagutzeko, batera garria da demokrazia eta zuzenbide estatuarekin estatuko konstituzioak mugak jartzea ez estatu arte, Erreferendumak deitzeko lurraldearen erakunde politikoei autonomia politikoa aitortuta dutenak? Okay, thanks. Uh, so... Yeah, and I'm happy to, to comment if other people are, are thinking. I mean, are they compatible, are referendums compatible with the rule of law and with democracy? I mean, I think they, they clearly are. I mean, there's a reason, and we've discussed the problems, but I think we should also remember there's a reason why these decisions are tended to be posed and set as something to be said in a referendum because they're considered such important constitutional issues that each um, individual is given their own vote. As a general rule, you know, each vote is, is counts the same and you avoid some of the complexities, the issues arising from representative democracy in these significant constitutional issues. This is why mm, referendum is usually um, the mode of, of choice. So I think it's, it's clearly compatible democracy with all the caveats that it said that it has to be. And also, I mean, Stephen Tierney's work, I think is very important on this, on ensuring that um, they're deliberative. So ensuring that the whole process of leading up to the referendum and to the decision itself is done in such a way that there's a lot of citizen engagement, there's a lot of um, citizen participation, that people are informed, that the question is clear, that the options are clear. So if they're done well, um, I don't think there's a problem at all from, from the perspective of, of democracy. Then do, is it problematic that states deny their sub-state units um, the use of referendums? Uh, I would say, I would say yes. Again, integrated with the wider process of constitutionalization that we've been discussing, the idea of giving voice 
minorities to different um, minorities. I think denying the use of referendums is denying the use of uh, democratic truth, obviously a democratic truth among others, but that contributes to um, multi-level democracy. So, I mean, I would argue that it is problematic, but I think because it is so ingrained, I think, in the understanding of the role of these referendums, I think states are very concerned if there's a referendum and the referendum comes out in favor of secession, that that automatically will mean the breakup of, of the state. So rather than engaging in a deliberative process that can resolve the issue, that can resolve the tensions relating to sovereignty, I think many states prefer the option of just blocking the referendum and then they avoid the issue fully coming out or coming, coming to light. That was all I had to say. I hope it sort of answers the question. Oh, indeed. Uh, actually, any follow-ups? Is it okay? Okay, then uh, I will give the opportunity to make a question to Professor Sergius Bober using his um, camera and microphone, if it's okay. Yeah, so uh, Professor Bober, if you want to uh, switch on the microphone and then you have the floor. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure, perfect, thanks. Yeah, super. Um, we are so far down the road with the debate that I think I have questions to everyone on everything, basically. But um, <clears throat> but I think it mostly cuts across to what was uh, said by Francesco, by Costanza, and then also in the chat by, uh, by Nicola. And at the same time to, 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 to Nicolas, I guess, who mentioned this famous cascade of referendums in, 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 in Juros case in, in Switzerland. And I wonder, because Costanza mentioned the issue of the clarity of question, um, and then Francesco had a dissident view on, on this. And then this clarity is very interesting for me because if we organize referendums on something so complex as independence, it is really hard to say what it means in practice. And of course, in the Catalan case and in the Scottish case, we had a huge documents prepared by the, by the leading political parties, by the governments. In the Scottish case, it was the famous white paper for independence, explaining how the, our, the reality will look. But it was, of course, one-sided process. It was, it, was, it was drafted by those who supported independence, but, but it was not necessarily, for obvious reason, consulted with those who opposed independence or with national level of, of, of powers that, that, that would be London. And I remember that in the Scottish case, at certain point it was proposed, I think by, by Professor Robert Hazel from, from UCL, uh, that perhaps a cascade of, not, a, not an extreme cascade of referendums, but actually a dual state referendum should be taken into consideration. And the first, <clears throat> first referendum would be on the very competence of Edinburgh to enter into negotiations with London on the issue of independence. Then on the basis of this, it would be possible to say what actual independence would mean. And only then the second referendum will follow whether the Scots want to have this kind of independence. So my question would be whether something like this might be an option, whether in the code of good practices we should include certain examples of the potential procedures, how to, how to go forward. And then the third aspect of this is of course the good faith issue, which I think cuts across to, to what Nicola McEwen mentioned in the, in the chat, because of course, how can we assume that those not willing to let, in this particular case, Scots to go, would actually negotiate the process of you know, establishing what the actual independence might mean? So sorry for taking perhaps too long time, but, but that, these are my thoughts after listening to, to, to all of you today. Thank you. There is not too long time when questions are so valuable. So thanks a lot, Professor Bober. Um, all the panelists, I guess that uh, you have some things to say, but uh, we may follow as he has mentioned explicitly, Constanza and Francesco first. Francesco, you start. Constanza. Um, okay, the problem of cascade of referendum, of referendums. Um, it, I really think that, but this is very political, uh, that, um, the number of referendum will have uh, an incidence on the result of the referendum. But this is my opinion. I'm quite sure that the 
clarity questions of uh, for Quebec and for Scotland have had an influence for a no answer. Mm? Because you really don't know, and this is the point that was made by uh, how do you do you say to the people what independence means? Because independence means many things. Mm? Your position in the EU, your relation with your parents, ex-parent state, and so on. So I I am quite sure that both no answer to the Quebec uh, referenda and the Scottish referendum are the result of the fact that there was only one referendum with a clear question. It has an influence on a no answer because you really don't know what will, um, what will be your future. Hmm? I, it's, it's not so easy to vote for independence because you know what you leave, but you have no idea of your economic, political future, because as was said by San Juan, also being sure that your state will be a democratic state is not written anywhere. Mm -hmm. Even if the process is democratic and so on, you live in a democracy with a constitutional clear framework, you don't know what will be, what kind of state you will be yours. So. There are many, many, many uh, uncertainty for the future. So this is my opinion, but it's really a political opinion. One shot is much more against the secession than a cascade of referendum, of referendum, because a cascade of referendum means a preparation of them. So a first referendum, if Edinburgh should start a negotiation with UK, will prepare the population to know what it means to start a negotiation with UK and so on. So the Jura example is the, the best example of the fact that it was a yes for everyone, for everyone in all the referendum. So, but again, uh, in a good practice, um, in a good practice code, uh, we should know, in my opinion, that a clear question, a clear majority in one referendum is much more, in my opinion, has much more consequences in favor of a no answer. But again, this is really a political opinion. So I really do think that we have to proceduralize secession. I'm sure about this. I am also sure that also the way in which we proceduralize secession is political. We cannot be so blind um, in front of this. Uh, yeah. Um, well, as to the cascade of referendums, I cannot but uh, repeat what I mentioned. So I think the the longer uh, the cascade, the better, in in my view. I mean, just uh, taking it to the extreme. Um, but then the question is whether um, you know you have to negotiate uh, every uh, after each referendum or you have to uh, have a clear path already predefined but this is this is not neutral of course the second point um nothing is neutral i agree with costanza um but nothing will be neutral in that respect anyway you know whatever decision you make is not neutral you know starting from having a referendum what is the constituency what is the time frame what is every, everything has a, a political impact and consequence and there is nothing wrong with that i mean these are political processes uh, and the third uh, so i think in principle i mean this is all left to a political process and whatever decision you make you come up with is political okay fine uh, we can uh, certainly live with that and the final uh, question the final point is about the the clarity and this is the point where I, uh, apparently costanza and i disagree uh, i uh, precisely because it has been said by, by everyone that also uh, vote in favor of independence does not mean independence immediately it means you know opens up many different avenues and many different ways of how to achieve it and so i don't see why uh, actually uh, a question on uh, more autonomy to be included into that would be less clear than uh, the question about uh, secession or, or not secession uh, i think in the scottish case a lot of uh, problems would have been avoided uh, if this third option would have been put to a 
vote uh, as probably uh, you know a big much bigger majority of people would have voted in favor of that and this was in the end uh, the the outcome so probably a lot of political confrontation uh, and turmoil would have been avoided can i say just something uh, of course, uh, but the problem is that UK didn't want to let them more autonomy. So the problem is you cannot, uh, I mean, make uh, um, the process without uh, one part. I mean, you have to consider that there is one part that say, listen, you know what, what? you vote a yes or no for secession because I will never give you more autonomy. So a clear question can be only a clear question because if say, UK had accepted more autonomy, we would never have the problem of independence. And no one would have gone for vote, no one would have asked a referendum for more autonomy. The parliament would have voted for more autonomy without even asking the people. So we have to remain, I mean, really realistic. The referendum normally are on secession. If you put in the same referendum, the, ter the third question, on autonomy, you just make people don't understand because they didn't even know why they don't have more autonomy if it was so easy to vote in favor of more autonomy. I mean, I think that we must be the much, the much legal, but also again, realistic and political. Whenever we write a code, we have to know what we want and we want to make possible people to decide to choose. But as I said, you, the procedure that you choose might have an influence on the result. This is, if we don't accept this, we don't say, we don't remain realistic. This is my opinion. Okay, um, I don't know if Elisenda and Nikos, I'm sure that you have a uh, follow-up, so I will give, give you the uh, floor. If you can try to be a bit short or brief, because we have another last question that I would like to introduce. So please, Nikos or Elisenda, I mean, uh, you have the floor. The fastest, okay, Elisenda. I'll be very brief, but but just because, yeah, I mean, I, I there's something I would like to say. I mean, I, on the issue of the third option in, in the Scottish referendum here, I completely agree with um, Francesco. And I think, I think we have to consider, you know, in setting out these principles, we have to, we have to be open to new ideas, to new ways of, of understanding the referendum in, in these processes. And if we're talking about using the referendum in these processes as a mode of democratic decision making, I think in the case of Scotland at the time, and obviously it's different for each context, but there was a very clear division in the public opinion showed in the polls across three constitutional options. So independence, more autonomy but remaining within the UK and the status quo and I think the referendum being framed as it was in the end as a yes no to independent it meant that there was a group of people whose preferred option wasn't on the ballot and they were meant to they had to choose either one of the other more extreme options which didn't really represent their, their preference so I think thinking in terms of using the, def the referendum in a way that enhances the democracy of, of these processes, I think this is a, a positive element and something that that should be that should be considered. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Great, Nikos. I will interrupt you because I have a question for you. So I will ask you this, and you can answer both what you were already thinking to say and the answer to the question. The, the question goes as follows: In the case of Spain, in particular, the constitution considers the demos as the Spanish people. You have discussed the territorial aspect on the conversation, and in my interest, this is Catalonia. Nikos has said that taking this to the EU is a tall order, but is it a tall order to get the Spanish state to come to the table? One thing is theoretical solutions, and another is the practice. One thing is procedure, and another is the political aspect, which connects, I guess, that what Constanza was saying before, and so on and so forth. So Nikos, uh, you can answer what you were maybe thinking and also the question. Yeah, I mean, very, very briefly, a, a comment first on uh, the very interesting debate uh, that took place before. I mean, the first point that I want to make is that it, it's very difficult to engage in, the, in in a discussion on the counterfactual. Right? So what would have happened if there was a third option in Scotland? You know, in a parallel universe, perhaps, you know, Scotland would have taken the third option, would be, have been Devo Max. And also in a parallel universe, there wouldn't have been Brexit, and now we wouldn't be discussing about an India too. So, you know, the counterfactual discussion is very, very interesting, but it, it doesn't actually add 
to, um, to, 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 to actually dealing with the problems. Um, now, with regard to um, whether, I, I, I'm not quite sure I, I agree with uh, Constanza with regard to um, her point that when you have a clear question, this is in favor of, of, of the status quo, if I understood her, her point, because, you know, I mean, anecdotally speaking, um, a Brexit provides for an opposite evidence to that, right? I mean, the, uh, anecdot anecdotally speaking, people voted actually against uh, the status quo and, and they, they embrace uh, insecurity. Generally speaking, this is true. I mean, generally speaking, I mean, there is there is evidence suggesting that um, uh, people vote um, well. They, they don't embrace this much, and they vote for the status quo. But it's not it, it's not always the case. And what is actually the risky position? It also depends on other uh, facts. Uh, it's not just um, um, uh, you know staying in a state is not uh, always the safest position, right? I mean, we. Perhaps we have in mind certain occasions, but in, our, in other places of the world, you know, staying within a state might not be the safest option. Um, which brings me to my, my third and last point with regard to the previous debate, which has to do with what is uh, uh, the aim uh, of, of, of this uh, code of conduct. And I think that we have to be um, careful uh, not to, um, um, uh, not to, uh, Shadow our views uh, by actually uh, having in mind only the cases of Scotland and uh, Catalonia. Um, uh, if we want the code of conduct to have a more pan European uh, um, use, it is important to have in mind that um, um, in other places uh, where similar processes take place, like in Bosnia or uh, in Cyprus. Um, the, the, the risks are different, and the use of the conduct might might um, might change the dynamics of the conflict in a different way that would have changed it in uh, in Scotland and uh, Catalonia. Now, with regard to 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 to, to, to the question, let let me be uh, that was put to me. Um, I uh, I take the I, I take this point uh, that was taken, and I, and and I agree that. Um, Asking uh, Spain to actually uh, negotiate is not at all logical, right? But 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 what I have said is something something different. Uh, is that I, I question whether the uh, European Union can play the role of the impartial actor. And in, just to um, uh, again to, to to go to the to, to provide the anecdotal evidence, in many many countries, you know. In, within the political debate, we, we, we the, especially in the Mediterranean countries where I'm also coming from, uh, we always, you know, sometimes we're always saying, and what does the European Union do? Right? So the, 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 the question is also, who is the European Union? And to an extent that the European Union is uh, influenced by the positions of the member states way more than is influenced by the position of the regions, there is a question to be made whether the European Union can play the role of the impartial actor. So how can you neutralize the European Union not to be influenced way more by the Spanish interests than by the Catalan interests? So it's one thing to say that, you know, bring uh, Spain to negotiate. Yes, I agree. But it's another thing to, to ask who can be actually the, the impartial actor and how can we make sure that the European Union, if it engages in a discussion and negotiation between the Catalans and the Spanish, well, the Catalans and the government of Spain, uh, how they can actually be uh, impartial and, and negotiator and actually would have a, a kind of a fruitful contribution, right? Again, to, to, to give you an example from other parts of the world, um, uh, in Cyprus, for example, uh, the Turkish Cypriots do not want to have the European Union as, as, an, as a negotiator because they say that, you know, it's the Greek Cypriots that are part of the EU. So to have them here, it would be they would be totally influenced by Greece and, uh, and the Greek Cypriots. So there is a question, there's a real question to be made whether the European Union can play this neutral role that we have in mind, can be the benevolent negotiator that many people have in mind when they ask for the European Union to actually engage in this kind of negotiation. Thank you, Nikos, um, and thank you all of uh, the four of you, because uh, now we have to, to close the debate. Uh, as a last word, well, first of all, uh, to th thanks also to all the attendees, because they were having great discussions and comments on the chat and the Q&A and so on. Uh, thanks to the uh, panelists for their amazing uh, intervention. And I will say that 
uh, it kind of seems that we uh, there is a sort of I won't say consensus, but a zone of possible agreement on the what, um, and then there is also a kind of uh, that on the uh, why. But when we talk about the how, okay, now, yeah, because I I ran out of battery. So uh, as a final comment, just to say that. Um, the how is what it remains open. And the good news is that we have two more panels to discuss on that uh, and actually focusing on that. So great job. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, Beatriz, the floor is yours. Thanks.